Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the uh, Subcommittee on uh, Federal uh, Workforce, U.S. Postal Service, and Labor Policy. Uh, today we have two panels uh, uh, that will be uh, uh, having testified before us. Uh, I, I do want to note, though, that we probably will have to take a break in between two and three for two series of, or two votes, so uh, we will have to uh, uh, take a temporary recess for about 30 minutes at that time and then um, reconvene for the specific purpose of continuing our testimony. Hopefully we will be able to get through the first panel before we have to uh, go do our votes. Uh, with that, I will call the committee to order. And as is custom uh, with the uh, whole committee and the subcommittees, I will read the mission statement uh, of the Oversight Committee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an, deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect those rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold the government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Over Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Today we are here to discuss whether Federal employees are adequately compensated. Uh, I will begin with my opening statement. and. Uh, uh, then uh, de defer to uh, the Ranking Member Lynch for his. According to the Office of Personnel Management, the average salary for Federal employees was $74,311 in 2010. The average private sector worker earned $50,462, according to an August 10, 2010 analysis conducted by the Cato Institute. The Federal Government also pays an average of 36 percent of employees' base health insurance and pension benefits in addition to generous paid leave. Taken together, Federal employees on average earned $101,628 in total compensation in 2010, nearly four times more than the average private sector worker. The members of this subcommittee recognize that our talented workforce performs critically essential functions uh, and missions throughout the government on behalf of our nation. We appreciate their service. Federal employees should be compensated fairly. Yet current Federal salaries and benefits are not in line with the marketplace when compared to the private workforce compensation. In a time when our economy is in a recession, the contrast between the government and private sector pay is troubling. The Federal Government has no incentive or obligation to reduce salaries in order to be competitive to stay in business. It can simply borrow more money or raise taxes. With Federal spending and unemployment at or near record highs, this hearing presents an opportunity for lawmakers of this committee to hear important testimony from our distinguished panelists on how best to address the growing pay disparity between the Federal civilian workforce and the private sector workforce. Over the past decade, compensation of private sector employees has not kept pace with that of Federal employees. Moreover, Federal workers receive generous benefits, vacation, health insurance, pension plans, retirement savings, and disability pay. These benefits greatly exceed those that are normally provided to the private sector workforce. Last November, President Obama announced a two-year pay freeze for Federal employees. Unfortunately, the pay freeze did not impact salary increases driven primarily by the passage of time or bonuses, meaning President Obama's pay freeze wasn't really a freeze. Additionally, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Federal Government grew by 157,000 people from December 2008 to 2010, while private sector lost 8.8 .8 million jobs. The unemployment rate hovers around 9 percent. The pre President's budget requests an additional 15,000 new Federal workers for the fiscal year 2012. Our taxpayers can no longer be asked to foot the bill for these Federal employees while watching their own salaries remain flat and their benefits erode. Congress has an obligation to consider all policy reforms that overhaul Federal compensation, reduce costs, and better align with the private sector. I thank the witnesses all for appearing today, and I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the witnesses for their, their attendance here. Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Uh, the topic of today's hearing uh, regarding Federal employees' compensation uh, requires us, I think, periodically to review the, the way we are uh, 
paying our Federal employees, reviewing the pay levels and benefits that they receive. But recently, it's generated, this topic has generated much uh, debate. As stewards of the people, we should conduct robust oversight into the Office of Personnel Management's pay setting practices, and we owe the U.S. taxpayer full transparency in this area, as well as assurance that the salaries and benefits provided to our Federal workers are reasonable and appropriate. I note that the debate over Federal employee benefits predated the 1883 enactment of the Pendleton Act overhauling the patronage system, and I am quite confident this debate will outlive our, the service of our committee. Like all Americans, Federal employees are not immune from our Nation's economic and fiscal challenges, and they understand the sacrifices called for in the two-year pay freeze enacted this past December by Congress and the President. However, we need to be careful not to get caught up in the oversimplistic data comparisons between private sector and Federal jobs. A recent New York Times article pointed out that when comparing private and public sector occupations, the clearest pattern to emerge is an education divide. The most reliable factor in predicting compensation levels is actually the level of compensation, excuse me, the level of education. And when comparing private and public sector occupations, the clearest pattern to emerge is an education divide, a divide that has grown more pronounced in recent decades. Today's Federal civilian workforce is highly educated, with over half of all Federal employees working in the nine highest paying professional occupations in the country. It is also a workforce marked by a declining number of blue-collar workers, dropping from over 30 percent to just under 9 percent of the workforce in the last 40 years. So the Federal employees are uh, a more professional uh, level of employee. We have contracted out most of the blue-collar jobs, the lower-paying jobs, which is why you get a, a discrepancy when comparing Federal employees to, to the general public. In light of the two-year pay freeze, which is squeezing the pockets of Federal workers who are also facing ever-escalating health care costs, today I am reintroducing my bill to inject con cost, comparison, excuse me, cost transparency into the Federal employees' health benefit programs, contracts between health plans and pharmacy benefit managers. This bill will lower Federal employees' out-of-pocket spending and the program's operational costs, resulting in a win-win for both Federal employees and taxpayers. I look forward to hearing from the distinguished witnesses assembled here today as your expertise and guidance on compensation issues enables us to better forge a high-performing civil service that is prepared to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Uh, members may have uh, seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous materials for the record. We will now welcome our first panel, the Honorable John Berry, who is the Director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. Uh, Mr. Berry, pursuant to committee rules, uh, all witnesses must be sworn in before they, testimony, uh, before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. Um, uh, Mr. Berry, uh, please limit your uh, opening statement to five minutes. We do have your uh, testimony, and we are grateful for that, and we are very grateful for you to be here. You may begin. Thank you, uh, Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I believe that the members of this subcommittee and I and all Federal employees share the goal of making government more efficient while improving services, and I look forward to working together with you to accomplish that. President Obama said it best last week when he said, I quote, I don't think it does any good when public employees are denigrated or vilified or their rights are infringed upon. We need to attract the best and the brightest to public service. Our times demand it." End quote. Our need for great workers could not be more clear. Federal employees hold lives in their hands and oversee large sums of taxpayer dollars. We need talented and innovative people at the Department of Defense supporting our warfighters. We need great doctors and nurses at our veterans' hospital doing life savings work. And we need tough men and women at the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security to protect us from another terrorist attack. And it is just a fact, Mr. Chairman, in order to get these workers, we must provide pay and benefits on par with other large companies for whom we compete with talent. We cannot and should not be the employer of last resort. Despite the complex challenges we face, 
The Federal civilian workforce is virtually as small today as it has been throughout the modern era. In 1953, there was one Federal worker for every 78 residents. Today, 2009, it was one for every 147. President Obama has frozen annual pay adjustments for two years. The raw comparisons of average pay between Federal and private sector employees often can ignore important differences between skill levels, complexity of work, scope of responsibility, size of organization, location, experience level, as well as exposure to personal danger. Even comparisons that purport to compare employees in the same occupations can sometimes be misleading. For example, some claim that Federal attorneys make more than private sector attorneys. In fact, while more than half of our general attorneys in the Federal Government earn less than $90,000 in their first year of service, the median first year salary for comparable attorneys in the private sector is $145,000. As another example, Federal cooks may seem overpaid until you consider that many of them work in our prison system, where they supervise inmates in a very dangerous environment. The Federal Government, like most large employers, also provides an array of benefits. While we need to do this to be competitive, note that these benefits are not free to our employees. Employees share in the cost of those benefits and, in many cases, pay 100 percent of the cost. For health benefits, enrollees share 30 percent of the premium costs. For de dental and vision, they pay 100 percent of the cost. For life insurance, they pay 66 percent for the basic premium, but 100 percent for any coverage beyond that. For long-term care, they pay 100 percent. I would also like to note that Congress and President Reagan reformed our, benefits, our retirement benefits 25 years ago, and this has avoided the struggles that State and local governments are now going through. Those reforms guarantee that our FERS retirement system is financially sound and fully funded at 100 percent. Bottom line, this administration is committed to providing the superior service the American people expect and deserve. Managers and employees who aren't doing that should be held accountable and ultimately fired if they don't improve. There should be no place in the Federal Government for nonperformers to hide. Our pay system is not perfect. I have said before it is six decades old and could use a reexamination. Uh, we are required by law to reduce all of the comparisons to one average number. This is imperfect and does not reflect the complexity of the workforce. But even so, we must reject misleading uses of data that perpetuate the myth that Federal employees are as a whole overcompensated. They are not. Our wages and our benefits are fair and they are competitive. Any reforms we undertake must meet the following principles that our existing GS system does well, transparency, equal pay for equal work, no political influence, and the ability to recruit and retain the workforce we need. This is how it has must be if we are to recruit and retain the best workers and carry out our critical life-saving and life-enhancing missions. Falling behind is unacceptable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Berry. I will yield to myself five minutes for questions. Um, Mr. Berry, I, I note that in the, uh, the President's uh, January 2011 um, pay agent report, it showed a 22 percent difference between Federal employee pay and private sector pay. Uh, and, and, and I was wondering, uh, did that include benefits, that assessment, that report? Uh, no, that is focused specifically just on the pay. And uh, subsequent to you testifying, you'll have, we'll have another panel. Mr. Biggs will testify that uh, Federal uh, pay premium of uh, 14 percent, and when combined with benefits premium of 33 percent, total Federal salary and benefits are really nearly 25 percent above those of similar private sector employees. And Mr. Shirk will testify uh, that Federal employees earn a total compensation of 30 to 40 percent greater comparable than, uh, than private sector workers. Do you agree with their findings? Uh, absolutely not. And, and why not? I mean, because I mean, one sense we are talking about strictly compensation and the other we are talking about compensation and benefits. Um, if we just, if we will stay for compensation for a second, Mr. Chairman, and I agree, I am happy to look at them together, but for purposes of this discussion, it is easier if we can keep them separate for a moment. Um, their comparisons are based on gross averages. 
as, as Congressman Lynch mentioned, uh, the Federal workforce is now a very skilled, white-collar, uh, high-sophisticated workforce. Uh, it used to be 40 years ago over a third of our workforce was blue-collar. Less than 10 percent is today. Um, and, to, and, and so we need to compare the Federal Government with like-to-like. -like. What the Bureau of Labor Statistics does in the Department of Commerce is they go into literally every locality, every one of your States in the, in the country, and they will compare entry-level, mid-level, and senior-level career for each position. So they will look at an engineer, for example. They will find a job in the private sector that is almost duplicative. And the private sector doesn't use the GS system. So you can imagine, this is very exhaustive, it is expensive, it takes a lot of work. Uh, the work that you are going to hear from on the next panel, they don't have the resources to do that. The Bureau of Labor Statistics does that on an annual basis for us, and that is the data we are comparing. So we are getting real comparison of like jobs to like jobs. The averages you are going to hear about from that panel are looking at the total labor force of the civilian market. The primary jobs in the, in the private sector are re share, uh, uh, retail clerks and service workers, waiters and waitresses. We don't have those in the Federal Government. And those that we do are generally are, are provided on a contract basis with the private sector. So that average, you can see, pulls down the, the private sector number, uh, but when you compare engineer to engineer, lawyer to lawyer, doctor to doctor, nurse to nurse, what it shows consistently for 20 years is that Federal employees lag the private sector. But wouldn't you also agree, because I don't believe OPM uh, considers the, uh, job security as a criteria when determining the value of a, of a job. Is that correct? No, sir. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, working in the Federal Government, our, our mission is long-term in nature. And, uh, and it should be for any employment. It, I mean, people go into employment for careers and, and not to change jobs isn't it, through a revolving door. And, and I guess my question is, is that when, when you look at fiscal year 2010, the quit rate for GS employees was 1.5 percent and the layoff rate was 0.37 percent. And, and do you have any opinion as to how that would compare to the private sector? Uh, our attrition rates pretty much track the private sector. Uh, you know, I have heard some misinformation from, uh, from some folks talking about that the Federal Government doesn't have a retention problem. Uh, let me just give you a doctors and nurses. In 2005, we hired 5,300 of them. Uh, it, as of today, uh, we have lost 2,300 for a quit rate of over 43 percent. I have a retention problem. But and, and, and that is primarily based when we, when we are talking to employees as they leave. One of the biggest and leading concerns is the fact that they are underpaid. But, but again, speaking as the whole Federal workforce, we are only looking at a, a, a 1.5 percent uh, quit rate. I mean, so I wouldn't consider that to be so much of a, of a problem. If it was 40 percent uh, as a total of, the, of the, the entire workforce, then I would consider it a problem. But let me ask you, you talked about highly skilled occupations such as engineers and, and, and lawyers being play, paid below the market. Uh, are, there, are, are, you, are there any circumstances or in, instances where Federal employees are, are paid uh, above the market? Uh, absolutely. And yes, sir. Ones? I mean, the, the average, when I say, I do not mean to represent when I say the 22 percent pay gap that the Department of Labor references, doesn't apply to each and every job or each and every employee. That is a, gr that's a gross average, it, it would, which means some employees are paid more, some are paid less, some are paid the same. Uh, clearly, to get that number of the gap, uh, more the, the clear majority are paid less. There are some that are paid uh, more. Uh, real quickly, I have just got a couple of seconds. Uh, how many days of paid leave are Federal employees entitled to? And do you know? Uh, we can give you, it, it varies based on years of service, Mr. Chairman. So if I could, I will just provide that to the, you for the okay. record. Okay. Thank you. You will have it exactly. Uh, thank you. When I see my time is up, I will now uh, recognize the distinguished gentleman and ranking member from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Director Berry. I want to thank you for the good work you are doing over there. Uh, one of, one of the things I just want to start out by pointing out is uh, I notice behind me there is there's, there's a chart here, uh, employment changes, that the Federal Government added 157,000 jobs. I, I, I just want to, now this is uh, 2008 to 2010. Now, you would think that that meant that, that employment at the federal, in the Federal sector actually uh, went up. During the, I, I went back and I, I got the numbers, because I was, I was surprised by that number. Uh, and I went back and actually calculated the number of separations, the number of people who left the Federal Government. Uh, we had 206,000, almost 207,000 leave in 2010, 90,000 in uh, 2009, just over 90,000, and 219,000 in two, 2008. 
for a total separation of 616,359 employees. So while they are saying there is 157,000 new first-time employees, there has also been a reduction of 616,000 employees who left. And I, and I think that also speaks to the, the argument of job security. If 616,000 employees, and these were these were deaths, firings, these were quits, these were retirements, uh, all, all combined. So uh, it, it does, I, I think, provide a little wider picture. Uh, Director Berry, much is said of the general schedule's lack of, of performance management, mainly its inability to appropriately reward individual performance. Uh, I think it was because of some of those concerns. Back in 2009, we experimented with an alternate pay system at the Department of Defense called the National Security Personnel System. Uh, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars implementing the new system. And uh, oddly enough, we had uh, 0 0.8 percent of people who usually uh, get, uh, are, are rejected uh, for, for step increases under the old system. And under this new system, this paper performance system, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 percent uh, were rejected for the step increases. So with the new system on paper performance that has been suggested as being a, an alternative here, we had, less we had less people get disciplined or rejected for their step increases. So I am just, I'm just curious, uh, it, is, it seems like the managers were doing the same thing under the new system as they did under the old system, and I am just curious if, that's a, if you think that is a viable alternative here. Well, Mr. Lynch, I think you, you, you hit on two points that I think it is important for the committee to uh, keep in its, in, in its sights, if you will, as you move forward in this, on this path. First is, you know, the Congress repealed NSPS, and so we're, we, the Defense Department has been moving employees back into the GS system. Uh, if you think that a, this, their pay-for-performance system, NSPS, is going to save the taxpayer dollars, what we found is that 20 percent of the workforce in moving back is on retained pay, meaning that they are making more than they would have made had they been in the GS schedule. And so, therefore, they are going to stay frozen until the GS schedule catches up with them. Now, that is a big number. Uh, the second point is, it goes to uh, something I have learned in the two years on the job here uh, in working on this, and I have spent a lot of time looking at pay, performance, and, and the combination thereof, and learning from the NSPS story. And I have concluded that it is more important to focus on the performance side of the equation first and get that right. Good performance is based on three key things that we, we do to a certain extent in the Federal Government, but I would not sit here and tell you we do well. We need to do it a lot better. And that is align organizational mission and goals right down through the SES, down to the individual employee's performance and then have managers and employees regularly having conversations, just like they do in the private sector. Are we on track or off track? And if we are off track, laying out the plan to be back on, and if they are not back on, they are gotten rid of. That is a good performance system. We, we can do that. And so what I am going to do, and what we just did yesterday through the Chief Human Capital Officers Council, is we have created a working group made up and chaired by two career senior executives, so it won't have political uh, you know, interference or bias. Uh, and they will report in on what can we do as the Federal Government to tighten and strengthen our performance system. I think if we get that right, then we can have the discussion about pay, and we can avoid repeating the same mistakes that were made under NSPS. That is great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lynch. We uh, have um, uh, recognize the distinguished gentleman from Utah for five minutes, and then we will probably recess to go vote. Thank, thank you for being here. I want to make sure we get the numbers that my, my, my understanding is since the time Barack Obama took office until now, there is a net increase of Federal employees, which excludes the uniform military census and postal. The net increase is 157,000 157, additional Federal workers. Yes? 
There is an increase, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, and about 75 percent of those would be comprised in VA hospitals, Homeland Security, Justice Department. But the or, net increase, the yes. net increase of Federal employees is roughly 157,000 additional Federal workers. Yes, sir. And you did announce in October that you plan to hire an additional 125,000. Not all 125 would be a net increase. But roughly 40 to 50,000 would be a net increase in current employment levels in the Federal Government. I think that number, Mr. Chaffetz, has been overtaken by the President's budget that was submitted, which shows that number staying flat for three years now. My understanding in the President's budget is that he has actually increased the compensation level in his budget by 2.5 percent, or roughly $6 billion, this year over last year. Well, uh, why the increase in the why the additional $6 billion? If there is a pay freeze, and you are not going to need very many new employees, why a $6 billion increase in that line item? I would need to understand better exactly what line you are referencing in the budget. It went from $236,175 uh, uh, to $242 million, or I am sorry, billion dollars uh, between 2011 and 2012, based on the executive branch excluding United States Postal Service. There, there is a natural growth, sir, of just na of promotions, for example. The President's pay freeze does not prevent people from being promoted based on performance. So the reality, the reality on a pay freeze is it didn't, the net did not save the American taxpayers' money. In fact, it didn't keep them equal. In fact, that number is actually growing, is it not, because of bonuses and step increases and other things? No. The pay freeze, sir, is a, is the, a cost of living adjustment that is a definite savings. It saves over $28 billion in five but years, if you're actually, $60 but, billion in 10 Ten years. The reality is it will cost the taxpayers more. Taxpayers will pay more for Federal employees as a whole this year as opposed to the year before. Had the President not frozen pay, that but, same number would is be what $28 saying, is accurate, billion right? dollars higher. I guess what is concerning to many of us is when the President and you in your very first line say, quote, President Obama has frozen annual pay adjustments for two years. It gives the impression that we are not going to spend more money on personnel, but the reality is we are going to spend billions and billions more because of bonuses and step increases and other things. At the same time, you are hiring additional people. So for the Federal workforce, it is working hard. They are somewhat offended because their pay is frozen. Meanwhile, you are out hiring additional people. Mr. Chaffetz, uh, in the President's pay freeze, he also directed OPM and the Office of Management and Budget uh, to report back to him on a program that will address and deal with bonuses and the reward and incentive program for Federal employees. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget and I will be doing that in short order, and uh, we will look forward to discussing that with you more. But I think uh, you will see that uh, those my, numbers my, will change. My understanding is, in 2009, based on a letter that you gave to this committee on February 16th, said that 779,000 people in the Federal Government actually got awards, which is a combination of bonuses and other things. In fact, over 63 percent of the Federal workers actually got, quote, unquote, awards. Why so many people are getting so many awards at a time when people are losing their jobs? Most of those, you have to understand, with a 2.1 a million size workforce, the average number in that GS of those awards is below $1,000. So uh, but this is not, this of is, them. these are not the Wall Street bonuses that, uh, that people are used to when they think of as a bonus. Uh, these are recognizing outstanding that, that's performance. That is offensive to a lot of people. That is 63 percent of Federal workers got a, got a bonus, got an award. And there are a lot of people out there losing their job. They have their own businesses. They don't understand when the President sends up, well, we are going to have a pay freeze, and then you are handing out bonuses to get around it. It doesn't make sense. How, many, how much money are you going to give away in bonuses this next year? It works out to be between 1 and 2 percent of payroll, sir, that is, is used in bonuses for the GS schedule. What, do you, what is the dollar amount of that? Uh, I will have to get you the exact number uh, for the record, sir. My understanding, according to FederalTimes.com, which put out a report on December 6 of 2010, it said that more than three-quarters of the 1.4 million general schedule employees will get at least one pay raise between 2011 and 2012. One of the things that I, you know, and I will take, uh, it is a, it's a legitimate concern to be addressed, and one of the things we can take back to this working group that we have established through the Chico Council is, dispute, is, is that dis a fair number? Is do you that, dispute that number? I, 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 it would, I'm, I'm, I trust you, Mr. Chaffetz. I would presume that you are well, reading you. from the a legitimate yes, document. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <laughs> thank you. The gentleman time has expired. Uh, what we will do is we will take a recess uh, to continue our, to do our votes, and we will re reconvene five minutes after our last vote should be within about a half hour. Thank you. Thank you, sir.